University of Cambridge International Examinations International General Certificate of Secondary Education June Examination Session 2011 English as a Second Language Extended Tier Listening Comprehension Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the test. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the test. Teacher, please give out the question papers and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the test. Look at questions 1 to 6. For each question, you will hear the situation described as it is on your exam paper. You will hear each item twice. Questions 1 to 6. For questions 1 to 6, you will hear a series of short sentences. Answer each question on the line provided. Your answers should be as brief as possible. You will hear each item twice. Question 1. Why are the train journeys taking longer today? A return ticket to Martinstown, please. All mainline trains are using a different route today. We've got ice on the line here in our area. Will it take me longer to get there? Allow at least an extra hour for your journey time today. A return ticket to Martinstown, please. All mainline trains are using a different route today. We've got ice on the line here in our area. Will it take me longer to get there? Allow at least an extra hour for your journey time today. Question 2. Why hasn't Zeb done his homework on time? Give two details. Zeb, where's your homework, please? I'm sorry, Mrs Ranzani. I haven't had time to complete it because I had band practice straight after school yesterday and the concert all evening. OK, Zeb. I accept your excuse. Zeb, where's your homework, please? I'm sorry, Mrs Ranzani. I haven't had time to complete it because I had band practice straight after school yesterday and the concert all evening. OK, Zeb. I accept your excuse. Question 3. Which delivery service is chosen and why? Good morning. This parcel needs to arrive tomorrow. It's my friend's birthday. OK, you can use next day delivery. That will cost £4.70 and will arrive tomorrow. The trouble is, I think he'll be out for most of the day. We can offer you express delivery. It costs £6.40 and is guaranteed to arrive before 8am. Good. I'll take that one. Then the parcel will arrive before he goes out. Good morning. This parcel needs to arrive tomorrow. It's my friend's birthday. OK, you can use next day delivery. That will cost £4.70 and will arrive tomorrow. The trouble is, I think he'll be out for most of the day. We can offer you express delivery. It costs £6.40 and is guaranteed to arrive before 8am. Good. I'll take that one. Then the parcel will arrive before he goes out.
Question 4. Why does the speaker wish to change the dental appointment? Hello, is that Mr Peters? I have an appointment for a dental check-up with you tomorrow, but I have to stay late at school. OK, I can see you early in the day. Be here for 8am. Hello, is that Mr Peters? I have an appointment for a dental check-up with you tomorrow, but I have to stay late at school. OK, I can see you early in the day. Be here for 8am. Question 5. What makes the ticket offer a good deal? Hello, Alessandra. I have 15 tickets to that new show in the town theatre for Tuesday night's 7pm performance. Would you like to come? I can't go on Tuesday, but I know my sister would like to go. How much is each ticket? £10 originally, but I negotiated a group discount of 10%, so £9. Hello, Alessandra. I have 15 tickets to that new show in the town theatre for Tuesday night's 7pm performance. Would you like to come? I can't go on Tuesday, but I know my sister would like to go. How much is each ticket? £10 originally, but I negotiated a group discount of 10%, so £9. Question 6. Which two immediate solutions are mentioned? Mum, the computer isn't working and it's the weekend. The repair shop will be shut. You'll have to write your homework by hand instead then. We'll take the computer to the repairers when the shop is open next week. But Mum, I know my friend Andreu can mend computers. I'll phone him and ask him to come and have a look at it straight away. Mum, the computer isn't working and it's the weekend. The repair shop will be shut. You'll have to write your homework by hand instead then. We'll take the computer to the repairers when the shop is open next week. But Mum, I know my friend Andreu can mend computers. I'll phone him and ask him to come and have a look at it straight away. That is the last of questions 1 to 6. In a moment, you will hear question 7. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. Listen to the following interview with an orchard keeper and then complete the details below. You will hear the interview twice. Good evening and welcome to our careers series. Tonight, Korn Zhang is here in the studio to discuss with us his working life. Korn, please tell us about your job. Thank you. I have a wonderful job. I'm out in the open air, helping to look after nature and people all at once. That sounds very fulfilling. What is your job then? I look after orchards. You know, fields and fields of trees, specially planted for their fruit. All sorts of fruit trees? Yes, and also nut trees. OK, so you look after trees. Are you responsible for seeing the fruit through to harvest until it's sold and eaten? Yes, but my role doesn't stop there. Think of all the wildlife which depends on trees. Bats, owls, beetles, all sorts of insects. What about bees? Yes, of course. There are beehives in most of the orchards where I work. Bees help to pollinate the trees and produce wonderful honey. Bees are actually under threat of extinction at the moment, so beekeeping is a really worthwhile activity. 
And are there any other animals involved in your job? Yes, we keep pigs in orchards too. They eat up fallen acorns for us. Often ducks and other wild birds also set up home there on the ponds and streams. Any more? The floor has carpets of mushrooms, toadstools, and other fungi. Wild grass snakes live there. Every part of the orchard is used by nature. I've never heard of orchard keeping as a job. I assumed the orchards looked after themselves until fruit picking time. Oh no, it's not that simple. So, how did you get the job? Well, I'm from Malaysia. I did a degree in ecology, then worked for a while as an assistant to get some fieldwork experience. And after that? Then I answered an advertisement for a two-year post. It was to work on orchard preservation and development, and funded by a wildlife trust. And here I am. Is your job very lonely? Just you and the trees? No. Part of my role is to develop and plant what we call community orchards, where the whole area is involved and receives the benefits of the fruit. There is one here in the local village. When setting up a new orchard, I show people how to plant and care for new trees. Then, when the funds which pay for my job come to an end, local people will be able to maintain their own orchards as a result of my support. Thank you, and good luck with all your projects. Now you will hear the interview again. Good evening, and welcome to our careers series. Tonight, Korn Zhang is here in the studio to discuss with us his working life. Korn, please tell us about your job. Thank you. I have a wonderful job. I'm out in the open air, helping to look after nature and people all at once. That sounds very fulfilling. What is your job then? I look after orchards, you know, fields and fields of trees, specially planted for their fruit. All sorts of fruit trees. Yes, and also nut trees. Okay, so you look after trees. Are you responsible for seeing the fruit through to harvest until it's sold and eaten? Yes, but my role doesn't stop there. Think of all the wildlife which depends on trees: bats, owls, beetles. All sorts of insects. What about bees? Yes, of course. There are beehives in most of the orchards where I work. Bees help to pollinate the trees and produce wonderful honey. Bees are actually under threat of extinction at the moment, so beekeeping is a really worthwhile activity. And are there any other animals involved in your job? Yes, we keep pigs in orchards too. They eat up fallen acorns for us. Often ducks and other wild birds also set up home there on the ponds and streams. Any more? The floor has carpets of mushrooms, toadstools, and other fungi. Wild grass snakes live there. Every part of the orchard is used by nature. I've never heard of orchard keeping as a job. I assumed the orchards looked after themselves until fruit picking time. Oh no, it's not that simple. So, how did you get the job? Well, I'm from Malaysia. I did a degree in ecology, then worked for a while as an assistant to get some fieldwork experience. And after that? Then I answered an advertisement for a two-year post. It was to work on orchard preservation and development, and funded by a wildlife trust. And here I am. Is your job very lonely? Just you and the trees? No. Part of my role is to develop and plant what we call community orchards, where the whole area is involved and receives the benefits of the fruit. There is one here in the local village. When setting up a new orchard, I show people how to plant and care for new trees. Then, when the funds which pay for my job come to an end, local people will be able to maintain their own orchards as a result of my support. Thank you, and good luck with all your projects.
That is the end of question 7. In a moment, you will hear question 8. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 8. Listen to the following interview with the inventor of a record-breaking car powered by steam and then complete the following details. You will hear the interview twice. Hello and welcome to Sports Weekly. Today, Charles Burnett is going to tell us about his unusual speed record-breaking car. Thank you. Yes, my car broke the land speed record for steam-powered cars. The record was set in 1906. My car is unusual because it doesn't run on petrol. It's powered by steam. Do you mean it runs like an old-fashioned train? Yes. The car is 8 metres long and weighs 3 tonnes. It runs like a kettle on wheels. <laughs> is it made of metal? Yes. The body of the car is made of a steel frame which is covered with sheets of blended carbon and aluminium. Mm. And how is it powered? By 12 boilers and nearly 3 kilometres of tubing to connect everything together. Are you an engineer? No, I'm a businessman and a driver. I had the original idea and I recruited a team of engineers to build the steam car for me to drive and break the record. Tell us how you broke the land speed record. A driver called Fred Marriott set the previous record of 204 kilometres per hour. To beat that, we had to finish two runs in the car in opposite directions, less than an hour apart, just as Fred had done in 1906. And how is the record worked out? The average of the two speeds goes towards achieving the record, which then has to be recognised by the International Federation of Automobiles. Hmm. Where were you able to drive so fast? On a beach somewhere, perhaps? For practice sessions, we did use beaches, but the winning record attempt was in a desert in California. We had had a previous try at the record, but sand had got in the engine. <sighs> so how fast did you go in the end? On the first run, the speed was just over 219 kilometres per hour, and on the return run, it reached more than 243 kilometres per hour. Our new record is the average speed of the two runs, 231 kilometres per hour. Were you nervous? I was, a little. But the car handled beautifully, and I'm used to driving our steam car. What would you say was the secret of your success? My crew, of course. Good engineers, good teamwork, and much perseverance. Is the car still in one piece? Oh yes, it's famous, and we're touring the world with it. We use it to raise money for charities by exhibiting it. Eventually, it will come to rest in a museum for old and famous cars. Thank you. We'll look out for you and the car. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello and welcome to Sports Weekly. Today, Charles Burnett is going to tell us about his unusual speed record-breaking car. Thank you. Yes, my car broke the land speed record for steam-powered cars. The record was set in 1906. My car is unusual because it doesn't run on petrol. It's powered by steam. Do you mean it runs like an old-fashioned train? Yes. The car is 8 metres long and weighs 3 tonnes. 
It runs like a kettle on wheels. <laughs> is it made of metal? Yes. The body of the car is made of a steel frame, which is covered with sheets of blended carbon and aluminium.、Mm. And how is it powered? By twelve boilers and nearly three kilometers of tubing to connect everything together. Are you an engineer? No, I'm a businessman and a driver. I had the original idea, and I recruited a team of engineers to build the steam car for me to drive and break the record. Tell us how you broke the land speed record. A driver called Fred Marriott set the previous record of 204 kilometers per hour. To beat that, we had to finish two runs in the car in opposite directions, less than an hour apart, just as Fred had done in 1906. And how is the record worked out? The average of the two speeds goes towards achieving the record, which then has to be recognised by the International Federation of Automobiles.、Hmm. Where were you able to drive so fast? On a beach somewhere, perhaps? For practice sessions, we did use beaches, but the winning record attempt was in a desert in California. We had had a previous try at the record. But sand had got in the engine. So, how fast did you go in the end? On the first run, the speed was just over 219 kilometers per hour, and on the return run, it reached more than 243 kilometers per hour. Our new record is the average speed of the two runs, 231 kilometers per hour. Were you nervous? I was a little, but the car handled beautifully, and I'm used to driving our steam car. What would you say was the secret of your success? My crew, of course. Good engineers, good teamwork, and much perseverance. Is the car still in one piece? Oh yes, it's famous, and we're touring the world with it. We use it to raise money for charities by exhibiting it. Eventually, it will come to rest in a museum for old and famous cars. Thank you. We'll look out for you and the car. That is the end of question eight. In a moment, you will hear question nine. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question nine. Listen to the following interview about the transport of salt across the desert, and then answer the questions below. You will hear the interview twice. Hello, I'm in Timbuktu to report the changes in the transport of salt here. Ali Shawa, a camel owner and salt supplier, is going to tell us about the situation. For hundreds of years, camels have transported salt from mines in the south of Mali across the desert to Timbuktu. And I suppose this provides a way of life and also income for camel drivers like yourself. Yes, and for the last six years, my faithful ten-year-old camel and I have regularly made the trek to and fro across the Sahara Desert. We transport slabs of crystallized salt from the mines to buyers in Timbuktu. Do you and your camel make those journeys alone? Oh no, many of us travel together for safety and help. Sometimes more than two hundred camels at once. We call this a camel caravan. When we get to the mines, we cut out the blocks of salt to sell. The whole area was once the bed of an ancient lake. 
Tell us what the problem is now. For a long time there has been no rain at all here, and the desert oases, with the green areas and the water holes, are drying up. So the camels get thirsty and tired and can't continue. Oh dear. So what's the solution? Many salt traders are selling their camels and buying modern trucks. By camel, the return journey to the mines takes 45 days. But with a truck, it can be done in 10 days, unless the desert sand causes engine problems. So the changing climate and modern technology is threatening another age-old tradition. More than half of the salt is now transported by truck. It's quicker and more efficient than using camels. So much more can be carried that these traders' profits have soared. This is forcing everyone to turn to trucks for transport and to abandon their camels and traditions. And presumably these traders charge more for the salt to make up for the increased costs of running trucks. Yes. The major effect has been that the price of salt has doubled in two years. I'm very sad each time I see a truck transporting the salt because people in my community have always made a living by using camels for this. Now everything has changed. What do you think will happen in the near future? Within five years, all salt deliveries will be by truck because it will not be worth any of us traders trying to compete in the salt business by camel. That way of life will disappear forever. I'm very sorry. I hope that we can somehow help you by making people aware of your problems. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello, I'm in Timbuktu to report the changes in the transport of salt here. Ali Shawa, a camel owner and salt supplier, is going to tell us about the situation. For hundreds of years, camels have transported salt from mines in the south of Mali across the desert to Timbuktu. And I suppose this provides a way of life and also income for camel drivers like yourself. Yes. And for the last six years, my faithful ten-year-old camel and I have regularly made the trek to and fro across the Sahara Desert. We transport slabs of crystallised salt from the mines to buyers in Timbuktu. Do you and your camel make those journeys alone? Oh, no. Many of us travel together for safety and help sometimes more than 200 camels at once. We call this a camel caravan. When we get to the mines, we cut out the blocks of salt to sell. The whole area was once the bed of an ancient lake. Tell us what the problem is now. For a long time there has been no rain at all here, and the desert oases with the green areas and the water holes are drying up. So the camels get thirsty and tired and can't continue. Oh dear. So what's the solution? Many salt traders are selling their camels and buying modern trucks. By camel, the return journey to the mines takes 45 days. But with a truck, it can be done in 10 days, unless the desert sand causes engine problems. So the changing climate and modern technology is threatening another age-old tradition. More than half of the salt is now transported by truck. It's quicker and more efficient than using camels. So much more can be carried that these traders' profits have soared. This is forcing everyone to turn to trucks for transport and to abandon their camels and traditions. And presumably these traders charge more for the salt to make up for the increased costs of running trucks. Yes. The major effect has been that the price of salt has doubled in two years. I'm very sad each time I see a truck transporting the salt because people in my community have always made a living by using camels for this. Now everything has changed. What do you think will happen in the near future? 
within five years all salt deliveries will be by truck, because it will not be worth any of us traders trying to compete in the salt business by camel. That way of life will disappear forever. I'm very sorry. I hope that we can somehow help you by making people aware of your problems. That is the end of question 9. In a moment, you will hear question 10. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 10. Listen to the following talk about an underwater museum and then answer the following questions. You will hear the talk twice. A giant underwater museum which will display sunken treasures from ancient times is being planned for Egypt. The museum is set to become the top attraction for around 12 million tourists who visit the area each year. Preparations have already begun for this huge, ambitious building project, which is to be situated on the site of Cleopatra's palace in the sea near Alexandria. It'll cost £98 million, and the funding provision has yet to be confirmed. Ancient Alexandria was one of the world's great centres of civilization. Queen Cleopatra's palace stood on an island which submerged after a series of earthquakes in the 5th century. Excavations have been taking place in the eastern harbour of Alexandria in recent years. As a result, many artefacts from the palace are now displayed on land, but there are still plenty left in the underwater setting. The artefacts from her palace, items of historical importance, are to be left in place underwater, and the museum is to be simply built around them. The idea is that the underwater palace museum may be reached through a glass viewing tunnel, which itself will take nearly three years to complete. The tunnel will have to be reinforced in order to withstand the huge pressure of water around it and the strong sea currents in the area. The seawater in the area is not clear, so will make underwater visibility poor. Some opposers to the museum say that it sounds like a theme park, and some say that it is just an idea and doubt that it will ever happen. Others even favour using the possible funds to restore buildings in Alexandria instead. Now you will hear the talk again. A giant underwater museum which will display sunken treasures from ancient times is being planned for Egypt. The museum is set to become the top attraction for around 12 million tourists who visit the area each year. 
preparations have already begun for this huge, ambitious building project, which is to be situated on the site of Cleopatra's palace in the sea near Alexandria. It'll cost ninety-eight million pounds, and the funding provision has yet to be confirmed. Ancient Alexandria was one of the world's great centers of civilization. Queen Cleopatra's palace stood on an island which submerged after a series of earthquakes in the fifth century. Excavations have been taking place in the eastern harbor of Alexandria in recent years. As a result, many artifacts from the palace are now displayed on land. But there are still plenty left in the underwater setting. The artifacts from her palace, items of historical importance, are to be left in place underwater, and the museum is to be simply built around them. The idea is that the underwater palace museum may be reached through a glass viewing tunnel, which itself will take nearly three years to complete. The tunnel will have to be reinforced in order to withstand the huge pressure of water around it and the strong sea currents in the area. The seawater in the area is not clear, so will make underwater visibility poor. Some opposers to the museum say that it sounds like a theme park, and some say that it is just an idea and doubt that it will ever happen. Others even favor using the possible funds to restore buildings in Alexandria instead. That is the end of question ten, and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number, and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.